I'll turn it over to Kevin, and Kevin will introduce our panelists. And thank you, everybody. Okay. It's going to be lively, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's going to be real. I'll put it like that. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, we're going to change the complexion of the room. We're going to change the tone <laughs> in this discussion in the very beginning. Um, so I'm Kevin Chavis, and I'm pleased to be joined with several distinguished panelists. Um, T. Willard Fair is a legendary civil rights leader and um, business leader, uh, game changer in Miami, been head of the Urban League there for many years. Give him a hand. He's a great friend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I'm not a civil rights leader. I'm president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Miami. President and CEO. Don't get me confused. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I wanted to make sure he was awake. <laughs> Uh, next to him is uh, my good friend, most of the time, <laughs> Donald Hentz is the founder and CEO of Friendship Charter Schools, the largest charter school in the country. Uh, everyone knows about Donald's work. The work that Friendship has done for children in this city has been incredible. Let's give Donald a hand. Yeah. And then our leader. Amen. If there is a Mount Rushmore for education reform, Amen. front and center, in front of George Washington, Absolutely. is the one, the only, Howard, Howard Fuller. Fuller. Howard Fuller. Jeannie Allen may have a little corner right there on Mount Rushmore, but Howard Fuller is the rock. So uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to ask the panelists, and, and, and I don't need to give them much prep or lead time, but I'm going to ask the panelists to each address the challenge that Brian referenced that Howard made 15 years ago in terms of where we are, where we've been, and where we need to be. Later on, I will ask you all about solutions, but I, I, I think the table needs to be set in terms of where we are. It's, it's, it's so obvious, because we can look around this room today. Uh, but I do want each of you to dig a little deeper and chat with this illustrious group about this challenge that Howard laid out there. As you know, all of us on the panel uh, do this work passionately. We've been around the country, and I, I travel all the time. Um, and um, this issue hits me in the face everywhere I go. There are countless stories that I could, could relate to you um, but one that stands out was, and I've, I've shared this with, some of you may have heard this, several years ago in South Carolina when I met with members of the Black Caucus there at a private dinner, about 10 to 15 members. Were, they were considering a charter expansion as well as a, a, a scholarship bill. And uh, one of the leaders of the caucus at the time, I think it was president and vice president, they all were asking me questions about how charters work, how scholarships, vouchers work. And I, we, I started talking about how it, it, it does help our kids and give these examples. And, and once it was clear that from a substantive point of view, some of what I was saying was making sense, then this guy stood up and he said, look, I don't care really now if it works or helps our kids. I can't support this because Representative so-and-so supported it, and, 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 and his family were segregationists. And I can't support it because you're the first one that looked like me to ever come down here and talk to me about this stuff. So what you need to do is have more folks who can talk about this issue from around the country who understand how to talk to me. Because I don't like the way those people talk to me. Now, if you dissect that, the, the depths of that comment begin with the statement, I don't care if it helps our kids. And that shows the level of impact that this issue has. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to T. Willard Fair and ask him to, to address this issue. We'll work our way down. 
and at some point we'll get to each of you, but I want to make sure that these gentlemen get a chance to speak. And I also don't want anyone to be shy by the issue. So be sure to be ready to answer some questions when it's time, because you know, we need to we need to let them sores fester a little bit. Go ahead, T. Willard. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeb Bush convinced me back in 1996 that uh, I should assist him in going around the state to get uh, the legislation passed to create choice in the state of Florida. Uh, and I leaped upon the opportunity to do that because I was concerned about uh, educational options for children in Liberty City. Uh, and I thought that by virtue of the fact that I had a great history of being concerned and this was the right issue and that I looked like them, that they would trust my message. But they didn't. I've never been treated so badly mm. uh, as a quote unquote black leader uh, as I traveled around the state with Jeb trying to uh, convince people who look like me to be involved in this issue. It was at that point I discovered that uh, a lot of times it was not about the substance of the issue, but about who you choose to be your partner in that process. I didn't know that Jeb Bush was a bad person I certainly didn't know that being associated with a Republican made me a bad person, uh, but I soon began to have to entertain that as possibilities. Uh, so a lot of times folks say, I'm not going to listen to you until someone who looks like me comes and talks to me about it. Uh, didn't hold true with me at that point. Lesson learned that I can look like you, but there's enough in my history that says that everybody who looks like me it was not for me, did not bring the best thing. So at the end of the day, I had to sell them on me, mm. uh, not on the issue. Uh, I had to upgrade their believability about me and not about the issue. And I couldn't do that uh, in a mixed audience. Uh, so Jeb and I made a pact. You go in and you talk to all the white people, uh, then you leave the room and I'm gonna have my meeting with my people so that we can visit the past, uh, commiserate with each other about the experiences that we'd had based on the color of our skin, uh, get all of the petty stuff out of the way, uh, and then we could talk about the future and the future of the children. So we learned that sometimes in uh, mixed audiences, uh, you cannot have the kind of honest discussion about something as important as what are we gonna do about our children. So I learned that lesson very well and very fast. Uh, fast forward 20 years later, uh, in Liberty City, uh, it's very hard to talk about choice and charters, uh, simply because uh, there is no obvious measurable value on the pursuit of education. Uh, so as I listened to the pollster, uh, shout out what the findings were. Uh, the thing that we are finding in our informal polls is today, uh, we don't have the same kind of interest uh, in the pursuit of education as we had 20 years ago, which means that my conversation going forward has to be different, which means that what we're gonna do and have to do in order to make sure that we take full advantage of the choice is first stop and pause and make sure that we restore value to the education. And that restoration process can only be articulated by those to whom the children belong to. It cannot be articulated by the urban league. We can mobilize, we can train, we can energize parents to do that, but at the end of the day, it's left up to him. So choice, yes. Uh, is it still an important issue? Yes. Are we gonna make any significant changes in terms of the educational process of the adults in the black community of Liberty City, I'm really not sure. Donald? Uh, my, my experiences were, uh, were totally different, uh, to be very honest with you. I uh, was uh, heading up a social services agency here in the District of Columbia. Uh, it was a 100-year-old organization, the oldest uh, social services agency in the city. And uh, 
with that, we ran a daycare center that we opened in 1905. And the interesting aspect of it is that when uh, kids left our, our daycare center, they often went to Brent Elementary School, which was a few blocks away. And uh, things started to happen. Parents would come back uh, and say, you need to go up there and find out what's wrong because they're not treating my kid right. And so uh, pretty soon we started to take it seriously. You know, you, you can't just go running into public buildings. And um, what we found, very honestly, was that uh, the kids were in a sit-down, shut-up environment when in fact in our uh, daycare center, uh, we had spent a considerable, considerable amount of time uh, telling parents that when babies talk, that's how they learn. And they really need you to spend time talking with them and you need to answer questions. And so it was a totally different perspective. And so right after that time, uh, we had the School Reform Act, and that's when I started to, um, to meet um, a slew of people. Uh, to be very honest with you, every last one of them is in the room today. That's a very strange thought, <laughs> right um, that, that they are in the room today. The very first person was Jeannie Allen. Because when I started to think about our organization establishing a charter school, if at that time you went to the browser, remember it was not advanced as it is today, uh, and you just typed in charter school, Center for Education Reform came up. That was the only thing that came up every single time. And so that's how I became familiar with that. And then, of course, uh, charters in Washington is a true legislative battle. And that's when I met my good friend, Kevin Chavis. Uh, he was All right, so- All right, now, keep it clean now. Keep it clean. So, keep keep it, it clean, Donald. Yeah, he was so people. nice to me. He always <laughs> invited me to his office so that I could speak my mind. <laughs> now, y'all know Donald, right? Okay. I'm just simply saying. And then um, we- all of us had a friend um, named Lisa Sullivan. Uh, Lisa worked with me at the Children's Defense Fund. She left and went to the Rockefeller Foundation. She became a member of the board of, board of directors of Friendship House, where I worked. And Lisa was hosting a conference of young adults at Vassar College, and she invited two old people to speak old person who was supposed to come from Friendship House could not go, so I went in their place. As an old person? No, no, I, I just <laughs> continued. But the old person who did show up was Howard Fuller. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, was, I was happy to meet him, frankly. I, I, I had never you know met Howard's him. getting the last word, I'm just saying. <laughs> I had never met that's an old person that's before. A, that's not, that's not But I, I, met, I met Howard Fuller, and, and, and believe it or not, it, it it was uh, magical from my point of view because after I spoke, I sat down in the audience and a lady came and sat beside me and said, I understand uh, you want to open charter schools. And it was Debbie McGriff. So that is my uh, introduction to school choice. And I can't believe uh, my life could have been better because four people I would really want in my corner in this particular kind of battle. And, and I'm thrilled to have them as a friend today. Um, you know he was the old guy. <laughs> <laughs> it had to be him. Yeah, it, you know, it, it is true that I'm old, but. That is very true. <laughs> I wasn't there in 1905 when y'all started. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think if I can quote you, you say, we started the elementary school. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, I'll get you. Yeah. <laughs> um, first, I want to you know, thank Jeannie for uh, inviting me back. Because um, you know how it is when somebody invites you to a dinner, 
and you stand up after they give you an award and start complaining about the people in the room. <laughs> Only uh, how So I, you know, but hey, what can I say? Can so um, here, here's my issue. I think that the complexion in the room has definitely changed from the time um, when some of us got involved in this. And I still got to have a discussion with Ted about when was the first national charter school meeting, because I still think it was, both Ember and I think it was Roy Romer's mansion, and there was 30 of us in the room, and I was asking then, where are the black people? Uh, but I think the issue I want to raise now is the complexion in the room has changed, but the power hasn't. And so I think that's the next challenge, because you, you can have people in the room, but if they don't have the same level of resources, if they don't have the same level of capacity, then we still have a deep problem. And I believe that we have a deep problem. And what I'm talking about is if you look at all of the new CMOs and networks of high-performing schools, and you ask the question, how many black and Latino people run any of those? And when you look at the fact that Donald probably has the largest CMO run by an African American in this country, but yet when you start looking at who the kids are that are being served, it's black and Latino kids. And so at some point in time in this movement, we're going to have to address that issue. And since I raised the other one 15 years ago, I'm raising this one now as like the next stage that we got to deal with. Because I, I, don't, I don't think that this is politically or morally sustainable in the way that uh, we're currently operating. And, and one thing I've, I've found about our movement is that we, we are excellent at having conversations. That's all I hear. We need to have the conversation. But the conversation don't necessarily lead to no change. It's just a conversation so that we can all feel good about the conversation. What we've got to do is to make this, this next level of change. And I'm confident that we can, but I don't think we'll do it unless we have an intentional strategy to make it happen. In the same way that many of our organizations have developed an intentional strategy to make sure that the complexion changed, now we got to deal with changing the power. The second thing that I think we got to stay focused on is the problems that impact people of color in this country are both race and class. And that many times what we do is we come up with a racial solution for something that is a class problem. And so we've got to be clear when we're out here fighting these battles that we address both of those issues. And so even as we change the complexion in the room, we also got to change the class character of the representatives in the room. Because we got to start hearing more from the people who are really affected by some of the strategies that we all come up with. And so when I look at this movement today, um, w w one book that I think is, is critical for anybody to read who wants to understand sort of the history of black education is Education of Blacks in the South from uh, 1876 to 1935 by Jim Anderson. And one of the things that Jim talks about in his book, in the first chapter actually, is what happened when black people came out of slavery. And essentially the argument that he makes is that black people came out of slavery with a commitment to education as an instrument of liberation. Whereas poor white people have sort of bought into the white supremacist notion that y'all don't need an education because we, you know, only those of us who run and stuff need to know anything. But black people understood clearly that education was the pathway to liberation. But we, but we came out of slavery without the capacity to form our own institutions. So we needed help. And so two groups of people came in. The northern industrialists came in and announced that we needed to do the Hampton-Tuskegee model because what we really needed to do was to be trained to be subordinate. The missionaries came in with an understanding that 
we actually did need an education because they understood that we needed to participate somehow in the society. And I see an analysis today in that, um, and, and, and I love all these people, so let me get that out front. You know, the KIPS and, and, and Uncommon Schools, all of these folks who are doing phenomenal work, let me be very clear about that, are coming into black communities, not always paying attention to how you gotta enter these communities. And then you have funders who come in um, with the metrics and all of this, not always understanding how this impacts our communities. And so all I'm doing is suggesting that we gotta learn from history as a reform movement. Because what people want is they wanna be helped. They do not wanna be controlled. And if we don't, if we don't grasp this, we're gonna lose New Orleans. We, because I'm, you know, and, and all of our reform movement, we're all focused on how important New Orleans is and Memphis and all of this. I'm trying to uh, sound an alarm <laughs> that if we don't do a better job of understanding how to respect communities of color and how to make sure that we spread some of the power around, there's gonna be pushback and there's gonna be a rebellion against reform. And it's something we cannot afford to have happen. And so in my view, as I'm saying, the next step is to confront power in the equation and understand the importance of dealing with people in the right way when you roll up into their communities announcing that you've come to save them. Um, does anyone want to comment on that? Thank you, Howard. You know, um, I mean, you and I have talked about this issue for many years. And this issue of power, I want to tease that out a little bit and making sure that the power centers are responsive and that they're open. Uh, how, how do we do that? And I'd like each of you to comment on that because if you are in the elite power center, say you're a funder or you have access, uh, you do get drunk on the metrics that are out there. You get sort of uh, beholden to your core group of advisors who tell you we can't fund these, this mom and pop because we're trying to build to scale so we need to look at this and there's only a handful that fall in this category and that handful of course doesn't happen to be folks of color because they may be running amazing mom and pops but they don't have access that some of these other folks have. How can we change that dynamic and also what can those of us who happen to be of color, who are already in the movement, what can we do collectively to help change that dynamic? Donald? Um, I, uh, I think that uh, that's an important question, particularly when you are thinking of organizations either making an entrance into the field or those who might be uh, established uh, and resources in school reform uh, are hugely important. Uh, when my organization got started, as I indicated, uh, Debbie uh, was, was uh, integral to that because we started as Edison Schools. And so we were quite fortunate. In 2002, we started uh, to move away and uh, become our, our own management organization. And frankly, it was, it was a laugh, uh, principally because when we were going to, to ask um, the funding a community, uh, no one was really interested in assisting us. That's as point blank as I could possibly be. I can remember really, really clearly uh, I got a call from Jim Shelton. We're both Morehouse men, so you know you're you're essentially in the same uh, field. I got a call from Jim, and Jim just lit into me like n nobody's business. It was unreal. 
well, why weren't you at the meeting? And I'm, well, what meeting are you talking about? So finally, he named the name of one of our uh, prestigious funding organizations and said, why weren't you there? And I said, well, Jim, I, you know, I hate to tell you this, but I've never heard of the organization before. What? You weren't invited to the meeting? No, I wasn't invited to the meeting. So the next year, the meeting took place. And I got to California, and, and I have to admit, I, I was happy to be in Palo Alto. My son lives in Palo Alto. My grandchildren are there. So it was great for me. Um, and got to the meeting and sat there. And the, the organization was, was small at the time. And so small that uh, my living room and dining room are bigger than the room this meeting was held in. And at the end of the meeting, everyone was asked to stand up. It was 3 o'clock. Everyone was asked to stand up and introduce themselves. And I thought this was great. I, I honestly did. I thought it was wonderful. My name is John Jones. I'm from someplace, and I have 50 students. My name is so-and-so. I am going to open a school in two years. Uh, and it was a continuation. Finally, they got around to me. I said, my name is Donald Hintz. I'm from Washington, D.C., and I have 3,000 students. No one spoke to me after that. <laughs> Not a single solitary person spoke to me. And I was sitting there wondering, why the hell was I there? I, I had no idea why I was there. My organization never had 50 students. We opened with 1,368 students and a waiting list of 1,000. So I have no idea why I was there. But in the parsing out of resources, I went and I said, well, um, do you think my organization could get the type of support you have given these schools, these startup schools? No. I said, oh, thank you. And I rushed and got some wine because it was truly time to drink. <laughs> and, and those of you who know me well <laughs> knew that the only reason I asked for wine, there was not a martini close. <laughs> So I took that as, a, as a, with a grain of salt. And, um, and frankly, uh, it has been the movement, the most consistent organization in terms of helping um, across the board over time has been the Walton Family Foundation. I, I, I don't care what your opinion is. I don't care what your politics are. I'm just telling you who helped me, OK? That's been the most consistent. We got powerful support as, organiz as organizations from the Gates Foundation. But then uh, when, uh, what's his name left as head of the education division? What's his, he runs up? Van der Ark. Van der, Van der when Van der Ark left, they, they brought this strange woman in. And I don't think a charter school has been funded since then, certainly. Um, the only thing that, that started out, came after that, with the, um, you don't have to laugh. I, I can see you sitting over there. Um, we can support ourselves. <laughs> uh, the, Is the, there a the time deal, we turn off the camera, or I don't know? No, 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 no. You, okay. uh, keep your camera running. <laughs> um, keep, keep it running. The, the, the critical thing I'm telling you, the, the, it brought somebody in, and, and the first thing was, why can't you all work together? Doing what? And if you were at my, the induction ceremonies for the, for the Hall of Fame when I was inducted in the Charter School Hall of Fame, I said in there that the biggest enemy of charter schools are those people who claim to want to help us. And, and that, is, that is as true a statement as I could possibly make. If indeed you're going to help people start charter schools, help everybody. Don't pick and choose who it is based on some amorphous criteria that turns out to be race. 
Okay. T. Willard, you, you've seen this. What are your thoughts on this? Well, if you're going to really do what Howard has suggested that we ought to do, which I think is where we have to be, and that is no longer work on complexion but work on power, then you have to also understand that the help is going to be different. Uh, it's one thing to help you because I feel sorry about your predicament. Uh, it's one thing to help you because it embellishes my image of being a good person. But when you start talking about dividing up the money, uh, when you start talking about uh, power and owning stuff, uh, then people have to rethink those relationships. Uh, we have, uh, for the last uh, several months, been talking about doing what I thought we had to do in the state of Florida that I observed when I was chairman of the State Board of Education. Uh, there were no real persons who looked like me who was making money. Uh, they were making a lot of good conversation about the value and the need for choice, and I understood that and still understand that. But when you start talking about uh, changing the power, then you begin to think about this whole issue differently. And your partners that you have conversations with are uniquely different. Uh, we've been talking for the last six months uh, to some of our traditional funders uh, about increasing uh, the number of charter schools in the state of Florida that are owned and operated by black people. Uh, we've also been talking about uh, increasing the number of charter school management firms that are owned and operated by black people. On the way to the bus, Don, it's surprising that we have not been able to convince anybody to invest in that kind of money. Uh, but I'm not going to worry about that myself because at the end of the day, I know that I've got to switch out uh, and do some different things. Uh, I think I've got the recipe of how you get it done, and I'm going to transfer it over to what we're going to do with charter schools. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, I was highly dependent upon the logis and the goodness of other folks to support the Urban League of Greater Miami. Uh, I, I'm proud to say that uh, uh, Jeannie is celebrating her 20th anniversary. Come this Saturday, I'm going to be celebrating my 50th anniversary. Uh, <laughs> And I am an independent, uh, self-sufficient uh, operator as an urban league uh, uh, in the urban league movement. Haven't had a fundraiser in 25 years. What I've been able to do is to develop the kinds of relationships with lenders and others to do what we need to do in terms of getting things done as we change the power piece at this point. Uh, so I'm going to have to make sure that the same folks who loaned me $5 million the other day to do a project will also uh, underwrite and loan me some money to build my own charter schools. It tells me that if we're going to change the complexion of the power base, then we have to also understand that now we're talking about an entrepreneur spirit, and we've got to step outside of the traditional language, the traditional partners that we normally deal with. If we don't do that, then I don't know why we think that somebody else is going to really let us make some money. Uh, we can make some noise, but can't make too much money. You know, Howard, I wanted you to address this, but I also want you to talk about one of the obvious uh, game changers in terms of, of the leveraging of power and the acquisition of power by folks of color, which occurred after the 60s, and that was the politics, that it became clear to, to mainstream business America that you know, once you had the advent of more and more African-American and Latino elected officials, they had to pay attention to that political reality. And um, one of the things that I know you've been actively involved in, we've talked about it many times over the years, is making sure that we are engaging the African-American leadership in a way where they understand how to leverage that power in the right way. First, to understand the value of choice and charters. But do you see any intersection between, you know, having the folks who are part of the power centers uh, find a commitment to change and share power and the leveraging of the politi political power that folks of color may have 
in order to make that happen. Right. Um, yeah, let me try to address that, Kevin. Um, first of all, I want to make sure that people are clear that, uh, I mean, I'm speaking for myself um, and the organization that I represent, the Black Alliance for Educational Options. Uh, we would not be in existence without John Walton. And, and frankly, a whole lot of y'all wouldn't even be in this room without John Walton, just to be blunt, for all of y'all who don't like Walmart. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the, the, you know, and there are other funders in here. I see BJ, I mean, I, there, there have been people who uh, have helped us, and I want to make sure that I'm very clear about that and appreciate that support, whether it's the Fisher Fund. There's, you all know there's only four or five like major national funders out here that have that have made this 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 movement possible, and then there's a number of local funders and and so forth. So I want to make sure I acknowledge that. I think what I was trying to get at, and then I, I uh, try to get to the second part of your question, Kevin, is people just need to know that there's a level of resentment out there amongst people of color about the hoops that we have to go through to prove our value in comparison to what some people who have never done squat are able to step up and get multi-million dollars to do stuff they ain't never did before. And, and, and you all just need to know that people resent that. You know, there, there are people out there who've been doing this stuff for years. You know, we scrape for crumbs. Somebody rolls in you know, saying, I got this awesome idea. And the, the, the way they're able to do it is they're all sort of connected and they all call each other awesome. And before you know it, hell, they all awesome, even whether they, whether they awesome or not. And, it, you know, it's like, you know, Stephen Brill writes a book about ed reform and it's all white people. Uh, I think Jessica just did an interview of the 50 top, uh, people who are, are, are uh, changing ed reform, and I'll, I'll guarantee you that th there's not five black people that are on that list. And, and I'm, I, I'm just saying it, and I don't care who don't like it, this is wrong. And, 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 and so again, the complexion may change, but if you still treat it like a junior partner in this, the impact of the complexion, the complexion changing is negated. Okay, so, all right, let me get to the second part. As you know, Kevin, one of the biggest problems we have right now is some of the biggest blockers to ed reform are black and Latino elected officials. And they have been for the last decade. And we've made some progress in, in, in changing that, but not nearly enough. And a part of this is just straight Democratic Republican stuff. And, and I always find that interesting, you know, that, that, you know, people are, you know, all in love with these parties. Um, but the second part of it is that if, if, if you're representing a, a black or Latino community, and the people who come forward with parent choice and other forms of ed reform are all people who oppose every other thing that impacts the community, it's, it's an easy way to demagogue those people and to demagogue those of us who would stand up with those people. You know, in other words, it's like, okay, I, I, I support the death penalty. I'm against affirmative action. I don't want y'all to have medical care. Y'all don't need no housing, but I support vouchers. And, 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 and we're all supposed to say, cool. You know, <laughs> I, I'm just saying, <laughs> That, that we've got to understand the difficult place that that puts some of us in who, who believe in parent choice and who believe in ed reform and know that it's important for our children. But all of these other things are important for our children too because they impact our children before they ever get to us. And you know, Kevin, from dealing with, you know, being in Democratic caucuses and being called all kinds of names by, by, by you know, by, by black electeds, that we still have a huge hill to climb in trying to change that reality. And, and unfortunately, we 
we're all sitting here talking about bipartisan in a country where bipartisan is like talking about somebody's mama. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, it, the, the middle, I, the middle is, is be, being slowly taken, or not slowly, is fast being taken away in this country. And what we're trying to do in the ed reform movement is to talk across these major divides and talk about why, why educating our children is an issue that should not belong to any party and that the issue of empowering parents is an issue that, as Hickok tried to say, is American. Except people's definition of America today <laughs> is very, very different than the definition that we started out with 20 years ago. So I think all of us in this room need to understand we have some deep hills to climb. We, we've made very important progress. But this next 20 years of progress, I believe, is going to be even more difficult because of, the, uh, of the, the, the political dynamic that is currently operating uh, uh, in this country. But, I, but I'll end, Kevin, though, by saying that those of us who believe this, we have got to keep going to our black elected officials, our Latino elected officials, and trying to make a case for why things like Common Core <laughs> are important or or, or, or why it's crucial to have opportunity scholarships, uh, vouchers. W why it's crucial to have different pathways for people to become educators uh, in, 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 in our systems. Why it is that, that, that we don't want you know, last in, first out. All of these things are important, but we've got to figure out a way to craft a message to those people who are voting to get them to be supportive of these policy options. And, 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 and I do think it's going to require those of us who are you know, African Americans and Latinos and so forth who believe in this, that we're going to have to be the ones to make this case. Um, and, and, and it's a very difficult case right now to make. And, and to that point, I, I mean, I'd be remiss, Howard, uh, if, if, if we didn't acknowledge Dwight Evans. He was the first African American elected official in the country to stand up for parent choice, yeah. and we appreciate. But, but Kevin, can I say, can I say something? I mean, because because I've had this conversation in the beginning with both of y'all, and I remember telling Dwight in 1995, was it 95, Dwight, at the at the Mark, Adam Marks Hotel. I told Dwight, I said, man, look, let me explain something. <laughs> when you cross this line. <laughs> and come over to the dark side, there's no going back. No, seriously. I mean, because you all got to understand that when people like Dwight or Kevin or some of these other people who are taking hard votes, the black, do, the black legislators that voted for the charter school bill in Mississippi in the last session, that was a hard vote. Because when we went in there four years ago, they told us you'll never get a charter school bill passed in Mississippi. And so, or, 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 or to stand up, it would all due respect, to stand up in Louisiana and say, I'm going to vote for an opportunity scholarship bill that is supported by Bobby Jindal. For a black Democrat, that's a hard vote. <laughs> and, 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 and you all got to understand that that's what we're asking these people to do. And if we're asking them to do it, we got to be there when they need us to be supportive after they take these hard votes. Yeah, yeah. Because why would they continue to do this and then the ed reform community run from them when it is now time for their election? So, so those are things, Kevin, I think if, we, if we're being real, if we're not just having a, a conference conversation, you know what I'm saying? You know, no, we could, no, no, you know, no, we no, come we to these, keep it real no, no, I'm all serious. afternoon. Because you know, a lot of us come to these conferences and we all militant, but we ain't going to do nothing when we leave. <laughs> We, this, this here is a real conversation about what we have to do after we get through celebrating the 20th anniversary. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and one of the things that we talk about in Miami. <laughs> one of my sayings, no, is that there's no problem in Liberty City that we can't solve because it's on us. Uh, we understand clearly that 
if we want our black elected officials to take our unpopular positions, then we've got to have the power and the commitment uh, to make it easy for them to do that. Uh, we can't uh, suggest to them that they go out on the plank on our behalf uh, if we're not prepared to protect them in doing that. So one of the things that we've done, we've identified the largest black district, and I've assured that school board member to do in everything that I tell her to do. <laughs> that at the end of the day, <laughs> I will have enough money and power to keep her in office. Trust me, I'll show you it. I'll go to another district and prove it to you, and then I can gain your faith. If we don't have the ability to protect the people that support us, and also have the willingness to kick them out when they don't, then it's just another conversation. A yeah. uh, couple things. How much time do we have? I don't know. H half hour? Okay, all right. So we're going to take some questions in a few minutes. I do want to go back to the uh, second point you raised, Howard, which is another point that I run into everywhere I go, and that's the well-intentioned, do-gooder mindset of those folks who go in our communities. They want to make a difference but they just don't understand the cultural sensitivities of trying to help those people. And uh, I want to talk about that and also ask each of you to share your own uh, suggestions on language, approach, how you enter into some of these communities. Uh, I actually heard uh, one of these young reform minded teachers stand up and saying, well, you know, we're here to help you. I'm here to make a difference for you. And, uh, and I could see the parents start to recoil. I don't know anything about this teacher's abilities. I'm sure that they were credentialed. In fact, the, the young person started to share the credentials, which is another mistake. Um, <laughs> and, but, but I think we need to to, 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 to talk about this a little bit uh, because it does impact on not just the parents who are the receivers of some of this, what they feel to be level of disrespect, or, but it also impacts on our abilities to recruit folks of color into the movement. And, you know, I think that if we could get a group of these folks together, I think I almost feel like that if you go into some of these neighborhoods and you want to teach, you want to start a school, you need to go through your own six-week course of sensitivity training. And you know, we need to have somebody fund that because this is a huge issue. And you know, it's being played out so graphically, David Brand knows this, in, in New York where you know, you've got some amazing charter school leaders who are doing some amazing things but somewhere down the road, there's, there's been some disconnect in terms of how some of these folks have entered into these communities. And understandably, you know, when you feel like you're doing good work, you feel like your good work and your good deeds to speak for themselves. But that, that, the way that trickles down to the actual teachers or the school representatives when they stand up in front of these community-based organizations and groups and start talking to these folks, I mean, if I feel it's condescending, then it's, you know, then, then I know that, that they must feel that. But look, talk about the language, cultural sensitivities, and, 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 and offer some, some suggestions on what folks should do. Donald? Uh, I raised my hand to start, uh, Kevin, because my organization is actually in the middle of, uh, of something like this. Um, we... Uh, are having conversations with uh, school officials in Baton Rouge and Shreveport, Louisiana. And um, we went down uh, for one of the initial visits and, and visited schools and things of that nature. Uh, but then um, we asked to meet with school groups and community groups. And we did what we thought was normal, um, the place where you, you are likely to get air-conditioned meeting rooms in, in our communities, the church, right? So we um, made a few friends and had the meetings at, at local churches. It just so happens one of the 
one of the guys who is um, uh, leading our effort, his father was actually a bishop, and, um, and that went over very well. They apparently n knew all of that. But one of the things that, that happened uh, that was so hugely important was us talking about um, we're not coming to throw everybody here out of a job. And one of the things that I asked for in trying to develop uh, budgets was how do we get money for teacher retraining? Everybody knows that the, the laws in Louisiana have changed significantly. People know that. But very few people have been invited to be a part of the change who are already there. You can pile as many uh, Teach for America stars. There is nothing wrong with Teach for America. I have a partnership with Teach for America. I've had a partnership with Teach for America as long as my schools have been in existence. So understand that quite clearly. But if they're gone after two years, then the question is going to be, what are you going to do now? And there's something about developing the people who are there, who, whose lives and histories are invested in that community. People do want to change. I want you to be very clear. How many of us actually started in education in our lives? Okay, I taught my first class 50 years ago. I know I look young, quite unlike Howard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I'm just being honest. I'm glad you ain't look my way, man. <laughs> I did. You know, we'll, I'll get you oh, next. No, come on, but, man. But, but uh, to be honest with you, um, the deal is, is, is offering something. If you graduated five or six years ago, from college, your education is obsolete. Do you understand that? So you are now saying that a teacher who might have graduated 20 years ago, that this teacher doesn't want to teach. Every darn week, we have a new education plan, which you have now told these people they must learn the new education plan and come to school every day and teach your dumb child. And especially the one that's really bad. And on top of that, they've got to raise their children, mind their homes, and everything ought to be wonderful. Why not try inviting some of them in the party? You know, as well as I do, unions are dying. They are going to die. Yeah. I don't know why you're looking at me. Well, because you're probably a promoter. Yeah, I don't know. Because you're closest to him right now. And, and, and that's fine. If anybody got his but back, in the process, need I don't need no Remember, I don't need that. But, but in the process, give people a life raft. You want to take their livelihood and then jump on them because they're complaining. No. Do something. Offer some training. Offer some retraining. Offer some re-education. Even the Chinese offered. Re remember when Mao Zedong, they would send you off for retraining or whatever <laughs> it was? Even, even the communists offered you retraining. Well, aren't you talking about, Donald, in effect that... <laughs> One of the challenges we see with the Ed Reform Movement, people want to want to couch things in terms of above the line, below the line, is black or white. But there are a whole lot of grays in this space. And uh, I mean, I had this conversation with, you know, Adrian Mayor Fenty, uh, with, with, with uh, Chancellor Ree, and I've used this expression, some of you have heard me use it many times, you got to hug our folks while you change them. You know, it's not, People are open to change, but especially for folks of color in our communities, we got to feel the love. You just, because of the, 
and I'm glad Howard, he, he, he talks about James Anderson's book about the history of black education. It, th that's so important because you've got a lot of these young, well-intentioned, you know, educated in some ways kids who come in these communities and they understand on a superficial level, but they don't understand the intricacies and the depths of the history of this issue of power and control and, the, and how easy it is for folks of, of certain communities to feel put upon. And, and that's an instant recoil. And when I say instant, I'm saying you can use four or five words in a paragraph and you have lost everyone. I mean, everyone. It don't matter what you say after that. And you're still piling on in the process. So how, how do we get to that? Well, I, I want to make sure that we're, you, you know, real clear. Because sometimes when we have these types of discussion, um, you know, white people in the room feel put on, you know. <laughs> And, and, and that's not what this is about. Because I, I also Well, Jeannie make, had this, she titled this for some reason. Yeah, yeah, but. <laughs> it's not alcohol. But, yeah, but. <laughs> no, but, but what's we important, guess. but what's important to say, and, you know, at least I must speak for myself. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, without a lot of these young people coming into our community. Right. A lot of things would not be happening. Agreed. That is happening. No question. Let's about be that. real clear about Agreed. that. Right. TFA, KIPP, Uncommon Schools, Achievement First, uh, Aspire, uh, just go on down the line. I, right. I mean, let's be really, really clear. Building excellent schools, the job that Linda does in developing uh, people of color as school leaders, we got to recognize that, yep. okay? And, and, and I want people to be clear that, that I'm grateful for that help and that support. All I'm trying to say is we've got to figure out a way to, to, to join that help and support in, in a powerful way with more people of color. And, and to be frankly, that's our issue. Because we, we got a whole lot of young black people who are, not, who are risk adverse. And, and, and I'm not, it's just like when I, when I made the announcement before at, at one of Jeannie's events that you know, we got to change the complexion of the room. Well, once I opened my mouth and said that, then the question was, well, who going to do that? Are you asking the people in the room to do this? No, I, I, I was saying to myself, I got this responsibility, right? Which actually d directly led to the formation of bail. And so one of the things I'm saying here is, I, I, I think that those of us who are in a position to do it, we're going to have to convene black and Latino people to begin to talk about what is it that we ourselves need to be doing that we're not currently doing to, to, to advance the agenda that I'm talking about. So it's not, it, it's, it's not on everybody else to figure this out. It's also on us to figure it out. You, you know, that, that, that that's a very important thing to say. Uh, and, 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 and again, I, I, you know, like, there are, there are a tremendous number of young white people out here who do, in fact, get it. And, and they're not out there, you, you know, saying the stuff you're saying, Kevin. They're, they're out there establishing authentic relationships with our kids and our communities, and they're changing these children's lives. Because at the end of the day, this conference is, any of this stuff, all of this ed reform stuff is only about one thing, changing our children's lives, changing the trajectory of their lives. This ain't about, you, you know, uh, uh, like one of the things I say to people is that I worry that some of the people come into this movement, they're technocrats. And we need technocrats, but the movement's soul is not about technology. It's about our children's lives. And, 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 and so all of us who are sitting here need to be thinking and doubling down on how, on how do we develop a movement that is sustainable, that, that, you know, that, that it, it is going to make a difference over time. And, and, I'll, and Dwight and I were just talking 
about, you know, because a lot of times we get together and we're all down because, you know, we've been at this now for 20 years and the world ain't sure. changed. And I'm like trying to be clear, they were at it a lot longer. And, and yes, we, we, we ought to be like impatient because we've not made the changes that we need to make, but let's not be discouraged because there are so many more things that are happening today that weren't happening 15 years ago or 20 years ago because of people in this room. But Howard, we just got to double down on it. Excuse me. You, know. you really have to consciously build the type of organization that you are talking about. That, and I think that I that is absolutely true. Um, I, I said something earlier about uh, our going to uh, uh, Louisiana, uh, Baton Rouge, and Shreveport. Well, let me tell you, I've had delegations of people come to visit our schools in Washington and Baltimore. And a lot of it stemmed from uh, Cara and Jeannie. Everybody was there at complication. Kevin was at complication. Um, and and what, what you saw was a room of 1,000 people. It was a hugely multicultural environment. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. You got to build the kind of organization that looks like the world you want. And, and, and I consciously do that. And I say that because when the people went back to Louisiana, this one of them was a man, he, 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 he has a 10,000 person church. And he said, I have never seen a diverse audience like that. And, and he was talking about our teachers and our staff. And you build it. You consciously work at building it. It's not an accident. It's not just going to happen because you think well. It is active work. I want to bring T. Willard in this, but before I do, real quick, I want to uh, follow up on what Howard said. I think he's absolutely right. The onus is on us. Uh, and uh, Bail has led several things that has uh, reap many benefits in terms of convening elect African American elected officials. During the peak, we had a couple hundred folks who were elected officials and staff, African American elected officials. Many of them have now become champions in the parent choice movement. Uh, working with David Brand, we've got 100 black men. He's been engaged not only in starting schools but advocating for progressive education policies. T. Willard was a forerunner in terms of the work with the uh, local. Uh, Urban League in Miami. We've got several Urban League chapters around the country who are advocating not just for charter schools, but also for opportunity scholarships. But I also think that uh, a, another untapped area that, that we've, we've talked about, many of us, is HBCUs and making sure that uh, we engage some of those progressive, uh, forward-thinking uh, HBCU presidents and start our own version of TFA at Morehouse or Spelman or some of these other college campuses so, so we can engage a new generation of African American educators who understand the value of, of embracing all options. So I think that those are some of the things that are in the pipeline and Howard's absolutely right. You know, 15, 20 years ago, those were foreign concepts that today are realistic. But the reason why we want to tease a lot of these things out today is this is a community-wide effort. There's, there's an onus on us, but there's also an onus on everyone to make sure that they are sensitive to these issues because that's the only way I think you can sustain a movement if you're sensitive to the, to, to the challenges you have because you know that old Einstein definition of insanity. You, know, you keep doing the same thing and wonder why you get different results. I think there has been some improvement, but we've got a little ways to go before. I'm time going to is T. running Willard. out. I know, time and then we're going to have out. questions after T. Yeah. Willard. Time is running out. We just came back from an, an eight-city tour in the state of Florida. Uh, Black Viridians Care, the acronym Choice Advocates Reforming Education. Uh, we're trying to create a revolution 
about the value of education in the state of Florida. Time is running out. We can't wait 20 more years to get everybody involved and on the right page to make this happen. Time is running out. Mm. Uh, the circumstances that we deal with every day in Miami uh, are, are getting worse, not better. Uh, so if we had full choice tomorrow, uh, things would probably not get better immediately. Time is running out for us uh, as a community. And I think we have to be very selfish uh, about that reality. And, and we have to be committed to do whatever we have to do uh, to make sure that the things that are happening are the things that, that we support to be happening in our community. We sort of drawing a line around Liberty City, mm -hmm. uh, and I've made it very clear that nobody comes into that box that we've drawn a line around if they're not committed to the same kinds of principles that we are committed to. And you can be Teach for America, you can be Dade County Public Schools. I do not care uh, about to whom you are represent or belong to. The issue is that we are trying to mobilize every adult in Liberty City to be excited about the future of their children. Mm. And if we don't do that, then we can have these great conversations and I got to go back uh, to a community where education and the pursuit thereof has no real value. So it's internally for us at this moment, it's not the Waltons, it's not the Gates. Uh, those are places that we can go to to get money to do other things. But the excitement, the need, is not in our community. So I, I really believe that the power that Howard talks about has got to be shaken up uh, and brought to life by us in our community. And we've got to take ownership. So are there any questions before I get to them? I, I have to, Howard, you know, I got to, you, you know, you've been my mentor and friend. And the older I get, uh, I want to shout out to my mentors because, you know, as I get older, there are fewer and fewer of them. Well, um, I'm, I'm older than you and he's mine also. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Howard, you know, my brother, that uh, I am, I love to hear you speak because I may every now and then take something you say and may forget attribution, yeah. you know. And I love that impatient but not discouraged. So you may read that somewhere, you know, and, and I may not give you credit, but I want everyone to know. I do the same thing with Tab stuff. So okay, all right, good, good. Because I mean, I may just use that impatient but not discouraged. That just may be a column somewhere that I may do, but I love that that description. Uh, and every time I listen to Howard, I learn something. Are there any questions? We have a few minutes left from anyone out there that's stimulated to share with this incredible panel. Actually, uh, I don't see them in here, but there's a group now in Milwaukee. Uh, Walden gave me a small grant, and we've created a thing called the Fuller Torch Bears. And what it really is is five younger people. Of course, everybody's younger than me, but, <laughs> but they're like in their 20s and 30s, I think. And the objective was, uh, the objective is uh, for them to, uh, we have a monthly seminar and then they shadow me. Uh, and the objective is for me to like pour out everything in my head that I know to them, but also to learn from them, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a two-way learning thing. But it is an intentional strategy to try to like really engage the next uh, uh, generation of warriors. Um, Bale has always been intergenerational from the beginning. Uh, and, and that's why Lisa Sullivan and Deidre Bailey are so important to our organization. Because back in the beginning, people wanted to form a youth group. And my thing was, why, why do y'all want to be over there with the, with the little kids' table? Why don't you be <laughs> like right here where all of the real decisions are being made? And so from day one, we had an a, a, a intergenerational approach. Our problem now is a lot of those young people <laughs> are now older, and we got to go back and get some younger people. And as you all know, or some of you all know, I chair the board of a charter school. And um, you know, we're, we're trying to become a high-performing school. 
And, and what I'm trying to do there is, and normally I would, <laughs> Debbie knows this, but normally I would have a group of them with me, because like when I go out to California to speak uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm taking four of them with me. And, 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 and that's my way of trying to constantly like have younger people with me for two reasons. One is so they can learn, but as important, so I can learn. Because I don't believe that the way this is gonna happen is the younger generation is supposed to quote, sit at our feet. Most, most of us, do, do, you don't wanna be sitting at our feet. The, 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 the second thing is it doesn't recognize that young people bring new perspectives to the table. And so, yeah, we got to do this intergenerational thing, and we have to do it intentionally, not just by happenstance. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I have no idea what you're going to say, <laughs> but, I'll, but but I agree with it, whatever it is. <laughs> Well, well, I was trying to raise my hand uh, when Cara made her statement about a, another generation because uh, uh, Sean, Brittany, will you guys stand up, please? Uh, friendship, uh, I'm the o only old person friendship sent to this meeting. Um, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and to give you some, when I uh, went to Vassar College, when you first met me, Sean was 18 or 19 years old, and I took him to that meeting. Um, that's my godson. Brittany heads up our new media efforts. We were having that conversation yesterday about how organizations have to work to stay relevant. The same thing is the case for our schools. And so we had to find someone who actually understood uh, what uh, Instagram and all of those other things are, because I don't. <coughs> and, uh, and, and Brittany has been leading that effort. You, you, you have got to make a way, and I agree. At, at Friendship, and I, and I say it quite seriously, there are so many young people who got their high school diploma who have gone on to college, who are on the teaching staff, in the accounting department and running other things within our schools that I, I truly believe we are making a way for another generation of young people in, in the education reform movement. I, and I, I really do dare. T. Willard or Howard? What's yeah. the question? I mean, I already agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he already no, I, yeah. I, I think Debbie's point is right. I mean, home. first of all, if, 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 if we, we want to look at you know, changing the complexion, but, it, but it's also changing the gender, uh, particularly in our community, in terms of making sure that women are represented uh, in, in a very real way with power. And that was an issue with our organization when it, when it was formed. And I see Jackie and Tansy back there. Uh, our problem right now in Bayo is trying to find some dudes. That's correct. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that there you go. I welcome you to the family because yeah. we're trying to find some men, man, that can do something. But, uh, but seriously, it, 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 it is critical that we look at all of these issues, gender, we look at the class issues, we, we look at the, all of these things are important as we try to function in, in the new America. And, 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 and so I, you know, I just agree with what Debbie said. <laughs> it's so important, and uh, for our community, uh, African-American women have been the bedrock of our communities, and they particularly have been uh, the key catalyst for education uh, in terms of a lot of our teachers. And, you know, I think that oftentimes um, they're given too much short shrift. Um, 
one of the reasons why I think that uh, Karen Lewis, the teachers union head in um, Chicago, was so effective and is still popular in that city is because she exuded that passion and that understanding of the community that is often lost in the discussion. So while many in the ed reform world said, oh, this what she's saying is crazy, but she does have that credibility in that community and, and because of, of, of where she comes from and, and who she is. And I think that's an asset that, frankly, we need to tap into. And so part of the engagement has to be, as, as Howard said, not just based on race, class, but gender in particular, because you know it makes a huge difference. Um, any other questions? Uh, yes. That's your explanation. Yeah. Well, can I offer you a suggestion? Okay. See where Obama's daughters go to school, and that's where high-income blacks send their children. <laughs> no, no, but, no, but I, I, I think your point is right. So if, if, if you read uh, Jeffrey Henry's book, The Color of School Reform, yeah, he makes that point that school districts are economic enterprises. That's right. And that for a lot of African-American people, school districts have been their entree to the middle class. So when you roll up in here talking about you're going to radically reform the major, for them a major right. economic enterprise, right. you're going to get pushback. The second part of that is that if, if, if you're an elected official and all of a sudden you're going to bring a new charter school into my community, which I, I need because my kids are not getting an education, but all the people you're going to bring in are white. And what you're going to now do is shut down the traditional public schools that was hiring people who live in my community and vote for me. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I mean, I'm not saying that's right, but I'm saying your, yeah. your, your perception. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think it is a solution. The first solution is, man, I'm not asking y'all to go without a job. I'm, I'm just want you to have the job at another place which means there is a job for you at the other place, at the other schools that are being formed. You see what I'm saying? So there's a connection between this black empowerment from an education standpoint and black empowerment from an economic standpoint that we're going to need to negotiate, if that makes sense. Okay, okay, folks. Let's give our panelists a hand. Thank you very much.